So we have 150 slides about technical SEO ahead of us. And from what I hear, Germans are very, very well with technical SEO, and they're over-optimized. So I figured that's going to be a treat for you guys. Uh, and I know it's late, so my only goal today is just to leave you with your heads uh, ex extremely exhausted. So how to deliver, a technical, uh, how to de deliver outstanding results with um, technical SEO? Let me start with just spoiling why uh, technical SEO is awesome, because probably you don't... You may not, think, may not think so. And most likely because it's low competition. So there is not too many good technical SEOs out there. So you can get really, really good results uh, and fast results if you do that right. Uh, secondly, it's scalable and results are very predictable. So unlike content marketing campaigns, which are sometimes difficult to scale or predict, technical SEO is very, very good with scaling across international structures and stuff like that. And if your website is basically shitty, that's awesome news for you. So the worse your website is right now, uh, the better a technical SEO is going to work for you. Uh, and oh, I can't go back now, but let's say that's it. So starting with, the, uh, with results. So Doc Planner is one of the biggest, actually the biggest doctor database uh, that database worldwide. So if you want to book a doctor, I know in Germany you have other website. You're the only market where we <laughs> were not that present. Uh, we have all, over one and a half million doctors worldwide. And we got a challenge to enter Italian market like nine months ago. And that's, that was a little rebrand. So we changed the brand from Doc Planner to uh, mio.tore.it. And basically we, we've managed to become a market leader within nine months and beat three other competitors who actually don't really stand the chance right now. With just technical SEO, there was not like huge link building campaign. PicoD, I don't know if you heard, like the, one of the biggest coupon websites right now in Europe and a uh, few other places. Uh, we merged, we pushed them to 24 countries. We did a, a little bit of a rebrand. So they had 24 domains in 24 countries with like discountcoupons.com and stuff like that. And we've gained 800 visibility boosts within just one month. So w within one month, we merged all the local domains to one, picody.com, uh, getting their, them to be a market leader uh, due to technical SEO within just 30 days. If you Google that, that case study is published in detail on, on page.org. Uh, so that's just an example of Brazil. Uh, so basically, you can see the scale of each, every single market uh, growing due to uh, international and technical SEO. That's, a tire, that's uh, one, of, one more example, oponeo.co.uk. That's a Polish company growing from Poland to all the European markets. I think you have oponeo.de as well. And we work with them for like two, two years right now. Uh, and just recently, we fixed a few technical bugs I'm going to talk about. And over this time, we've, get, we've got like around 20 times, maybe even more visibility, I didn't count, uh, within just two years. So they, they, they're becoming a leader in the UK in an entire market. I don't know if you know it. It's fairly difficult. Live chat, you know that little annoying window in every single e-commerce store on the right bottom side. I know. I love it too. I like, may I help you and stuff like that. We work with them for a while. They're from the same city uh, as I'm from. And we've also, just with a little bit of technical SEO, there is no link building campaign at all. Uh, we've managed to, uh, again, triple, quadruple their visibility within uh, a few months. And we mostly work with either startups going international or very, very large structure, like, uh, like this one. Uh, and that's what I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about smaller websites today, just what you can get with technical SEO for very, very large structures. So I was thinking about a very lame title for, for that part, and that's what I came up with. Uh, so things we've learned working with website, getting 50 million users per month and more. <sighs> so yeah, so basically that's just to, to show some swag. Uh, OK. so. What we've learned, we need to go a little bit deeper. So basically just fixing your titles, H1 and stuff like that uh, won't really uh, help much. So 
Obviously, we start with all the obvious stuff like information architecture, content, CMS, code, performance, and server architecture. But there is a huge difference between good websites. You, you are Germans, you should know that. You're very good with technical SEO. There is a huge difference between good website. We can compare like the Fiat to Volkswagen. So, and awesome website. So just to give you an example that sometimes two different cars can look very similar, can cost almost the same, can look similar on paper, but there is a huge difference in what's under the hood. Ah. So as you can see, both cars, similar horsepower, just the technology, so that the, the little things make it much, much uh, better. So as you can see, at the data is just 0 0.7 second better for Volkswagen, but he's the first one on the end line, and that's what we really aim for. So let's take a look under the hood and start with performance. So you know, I know you guys will probably heard a lot of website performance, but I think it's going to be interesting. So first of all, Google or users need to find their website. The first, like, the first step for that is TLD. So if you choose your TLD, either it's going to be .com, .guru, .sexy, or whatever, it really affects your performance. So if you look at PL, like I can laugh, I'm Polish, uh, they're fairly slow. Uh, it's 90 milliseconds for just a TLD. Mm. Yeah. See? Speaking of performance. So yeah, uh, Italians, we all know all the stereotypes. I won't even mention them. Even slower. <laughs> Fiat again. Uh, Germans, average time is fairly good, but minimal time, uh, minimal time is fairly impressive. It's just two milliseconds for uh, the best request. Going to .NET is definitely the worst. It's not connected to any country, so there is no joke here. So um, .co is actually the, the best uh, I found, but we can go through uh, a lot of TLDs by when choosing a domain. So as you can see, none of us is optimizing that, I guess but that different, differs from 6 milliseconds to up to 120. And I guess you all know that we have around 600 milliseconds for time to first byte for Google to be seen in Search Console. It's actually time spent downloading a page. So that adds up to DNS and performance. So if you look at different DNS providers, okay, it's a little bit jumpy today, sorry for that. It goes from 10 milliseconds to up to even 200 milliseconds for just a DNS provider, which we also rarely optimize. So that adds up to network latency, and it can be be between five milliseconds when you have very good TLD and very good DNS to 400 milliseconds with a shitty TLD and shitty DNS, things we don't really optimize. But moving forward, it all affects Google crawler budget, which we care about the most. So what we want to see usually is pages crawled per day going up, kilobytes going down, and yeah. <laughs> and Wukash, can you give me my own clicker from my backpack, please? <laughs> because it can take a while. Uh, yeah, we did it. And time spent downloading a page uh, going down. So we all want to see that to, to get like huge, huge performance for all of our clients. So now focus on time, uh, let's focus on time to first byte. Time to first byte. No, 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 clicker. There is my own. <laughs> okay. Uh, Time to first byte is made of network latency, so DNS I was talking about, and, um, and TLD request, and backend processing, which is a very broad term. So if, if we think about backend processing, it's basically everything going on behind the scenes. So let's now take a look at the backend. So Nginx versus Apache. Thank you. Those are two most popular technologies that we uh, are seeing online, and I guess that 90% of uh, people in the room here either host our websites or on one of those two uh, technologies. 
No. Yeah, sorry, just close this one. Yeah, we're home. Sorry for that case. Uh, we can have a look how that, how simple um, migration from um, from engine uh, from Apache to Nginx affects our time to first byte. So basically, time spent downloading a page goes down from like one half mm, second to roughly 40, 400 milliseconds. How it affects um, uh, pages crawled per day as well, so our crawler budget. So just that can help. But what's the key uh, difference between those two technologies? Uh, Apache is a classic and stable technology that we all know. And uh, unfortunately, it's not too efficient. So it was, made, it was built in around 2000, in year 2000, but it won't really handle a uh, high traffic website well. So if you have a client coming to you with 10 million visits per month, even, uh, and he's on Apache, just look into that. It's possible to configure, but most likely it could be a problem. On the other hand, Nginx uh, is most popular after Apache, so it's second most popular uh, server software, uh, and can be installed on top of Apache, so it's not like a huge, huge problem, uh, and will handle huge traffic very, very well. Mm, so, just to give you an idea, if you have a small WordPress website, Apache is totally fine. It's cheaper to maintain and stuff like that. But if you have a large, large website, uh, definitely consider either Nginx or there are a few other technologies. But you should start your journey with your client with just looking into such a basic uh, thing. Then, next thing, we can leverage caching. So, that's a uh, definition that I gave you just to screw with you. It's very not friendly. So basically, caching is storing all the important files in front of the line. Very simple uh, thing. So let's start with browser caching. So basically, what happens on your, eyes, uh, on your side, so on, on client in your laptop or uh, desktop. Browser stores stuff like logo, CSS, JavaScript, multimedia fonts, and it, co it causes faster page render, lower server load, and there is less request. Again, you would be surprised how many of your clients don't really enable that on, within their domains. And if you imagine the like, uh, real-life use of browser caching, if you open Amazon.com right now, you're going to store uh, like their logo, their CSS file, JavaScript, and stuff like that. So if you're brow browsing from the first page deeper into the uh, domain, you're going to see uh, that content loading like in lighting fast because of browser caching. And on the other side is something that you probably optimize if you work with clients, server caching, which is a little bit more complex. Uh, it's again, it stores commonly used files, so like all the images, CSS files, stuff like that, in front of the line, uh, and it minimizes server load and speeds up page load. Definitely makes it much, much easier on a database. Uh, just as an example, uh, just storing static menu of, let's say, Amazon.com mm, is going to give you uh, 100, milliseconds, 100 milliseconds less uh, in, in page load. So if you store in memcache, so servers RAM, uh, just static menu, which is usually on the top and right, you can save 0 0.1 second with just doing that. And usually, we're going to see one of those five scenarios with servers. It may look complicated, but most of our uh, clients, most of the websites uh, are built on a three-tiered server architecture, and we usually want to go with this solution, where basically cache is working on our backend and supports the database. This is how we can get like, really, really good time to first byte and very cool uh, results. But then, the ad, like, again, there is one problem that's usually overlooked. Uh, a lot of uh, website servers doesn't really enable server cache for crawlers. A while ago, it was one of the directives, so a lot of developer is disabling server cache for crawlers. It was supposed to be like that. don't know why. Uh, you're you're going to see that quite often. So to check if that's done well, go to your search console, fetch as Google. You probably know how to do that. 
uh, and see the results in the bottom of that page. So you will see this one is with cache disabled for uh, one of our clients, and usually it should look like that, so below 50 milliseconds for, uh, for download time for the content. So again, we covered how to get uh, our time down, so how to get our time spending uh, downloading a page down, uh, but I didn't really explain how to get kilobytes per day down when getting more pages scrolled at the same time. It's very, very simple, and again, it's very often overlooked. Just enable gzip uh, on your server, just check if it's done. You can use tools like onpage.org and their focus feature to basically see if, the, uh, if gzip was enabled. Very simple, gives awesome, awesome results. That's just enable, enabling gzip. So as you can see, there is like around 10 times pages more downloaded, but the kilobytes per day went down, even though. <laughs> now, we're going to get into a little bit complex topic. So cache control headers, I'm going to try to go through that as simple as possible. But that's really some, something that's, again, that's overlooked and it's going to give you awesome results. Uh, so cache control headers in a simplified uh, version is something you're going to see right here. So that's one of the biggest websites online. So you're going to see that the content expires 1st January 2000, but at the same time, it was last modified a few days ago. And again, Googlebot is going to come to the website, to this page, and see, OK, this content expired 17 years ago. Again, there is a very simple solution that you have to check when working with your uh, clients. And just the most popular solution and recommended by uh, Google Webmaster Guidelines is if modified since. And with if modified since header in your server, when Googlebot comes to your client server, it's going to get, it's going to ask, I want to see this content, but only if it's modified since last week when I crawled this page last time. If, the, if, the, if content wasn't modified, your server is returning three or four code, not modified, and your crawler budget is going up in a really, really nice pace. Uh, and of course, you can add the same data to your sitemap, so last modified from, uh, from this, uh, this database. There is, yeah, this is how it looks like. So let's say that I'm a Googlebot. I'm going to go get fame.html from gralevg.com. And only if it's, it was modified since 22 minutes ago, and my server is going to go, file wasn't changed, there's no need to download that again, and it's going to respond with 304 uh, server, uh, status code, and won't send the content. Of course, if content would be modified, code 200 and serves content. There is one more solution that's not used as often, but also works fairly well. Uh, Googlebot comes last and says, OK, last time I visited this page, I got this e-tag. So this bunch of numbers and letters. And server checks that, OK, I have the same version. And again, 304. So it, sometimes it can boost your crawler budget two, three times within a few days of implementation. And just to check how it's configured for your client, just go quickly to redbot.org, enter like, I use donaldtrump.com, but use any domain that you like and see mm, if that's configured properly. Just fixing that, so just sending one email to your developer, it can boost your crawler budget a few times. And just remember that you configure that not only for HTML content, so not only for your static pages, but for images, CSS, JS, uh, media files, fonts, and so on. Yeah, so basically just implementing that doesn't really cost much. It's a few hours of uh, work for developer. It gives us a lot of benefits. But there is one downside to, to that, and you will see that working with your CDN clients a lot. It has to be war configured properly to work with content delivery network. How many of you guys know what content delivery network is? 
very good. I expected more from Germans, but <laughs> but very good. So let me explain anyways. Uh, so that's our server. So basically, that's where like my website would be hosted. So that would be like searchmetrics.com. But at the same time, we target people in South America and Europe, and we host our website in Berlin. So if I open this website from South America, I'm going to get that from the closest possible location. So the network latency uh, we talked about is much, much better. But as everything, it comes with possible problems. Very often when you deploy content delivery network, you're going to see a position drop. If you Google content delivery network, lost my rankings, you're going to see a shitload of results. It's very, very common. It's worse than migrations to HTTPS going bad. So there is, there is downside that you need to take care of, uh, mostly because of bad configuration of cache control headers I just mentioned. <clears throat> and then that's going to be really interesting for you guys. Uh, IP really matters for SEO. And there was a lot, lot of fails IP related. And what can actually affect your IP is load balancers, so stuff sitting in front of your servers, pushing con uh, traffic to, uh, to the best place, content delivery network, cloud hosting, and st stuff like that. Why is IP so important? Let me quote John Miller. So if IP changes often, they're going to look at that as you uh, moving servers quite often, and they will basically reset your crawler budget. So they won't trust the new IP. They need to see how it performs. I translated that. So if you change your IP often, you're fucked. And that's you, basically, again, something that's difficult to diagnose. But there is a very cool website, viewdns.info slash IP history. And if you're going to see, this is quite normal. If you're going to see that, for example, within last month, your content delivery network, load balancers, and whatnot changed IP 10 times, you're going to see quite a big, large problem that you will never, ever solve by uh, traditional ways of uh, improving uh, crawler budget. So now we have all that covered. So we have all the performance in place. Uh, so there are a few other things that you should look at and basically even ask developers to make them feel a little bit less comfortable. So all the scripts, like scripts that are not essential for a website to load, should load as async or, and most developers won't know that, after this. So just tell them, after window, window on load event. Basically, that's the event that stops Google, uh, Google's timer for, uh, for your website performance. Sorry. So uh, there are a few tools that can look into your website performance, especially time to first byte. And this one is awesome. There's just one place and it gives you one number. Uh, and definitely go through uh, those tools with every single client you, uh, you work with. OK, we need to speed up. We have 70 slides and 17 minutes. So now moving on to source code. And by the way, I removed all the jokes from my presentation because I figured I'm driving to Germany, so <laughs> <laughs> that's what I hear. Uh, so source code versus SEO. Uh, and we, we know about all these things. I won't even read them. But just to give you an idea that most of old websites will have a lot of CSS bugs and manipulations. So if your website was redesigned three times, most likely you can see a lot of leftovers from old design in your code in your front end. So basically, that's an example here that I mentioned before. We boosted the visibility by 100% by sorting out the comments that were hidden. So basically, sorting out the comments for uh, e-commerce e website and fixing shitload of CSS crap that was within the code by, you know, endless developers moving to to new design and leaving a lot of junk in CSS and HTML. That was a fairly easy win, I must say. <laughs> and now, how to reduce the number of requests? So if you're going to go to one of those websites I gave you, like GTmetrics, it's going to tell you to load your website 
uh, let's say, DonaldTrump.com, you need 250 requests. So why is that happening? And there is a very cool hack for that. Just stay with me, I'm going to explain. If you have 20 images on your home page, there are static images like Facebook icon, Twitter, all this boring stuff like lo lo your logo and stuff like that, there is a tool that can make them into a font. So instead of fetching 20 images, it just fetches one font, and all your images are translated like to letters within a font, which is very often used by the developers, but only the smart ones. So if you go to this website, it's very, very easy. You don't need to do that. Just ask your developers, like, guys, can you merge all those like 40 images into one uh, font for me? There is an old solution, CSS price, but it's a little bit last season, and I wouldn't uh, recommend that. So next step is combining JS and CSS scripts. Uh, and if you, huh, if you Google, because this link is somehow not visible, if you, if you go to uh, yeah, google.com page, page speed mod module, if you Google page speed module, uh, you're going to see the tool that can combine both JS and CSS. I'm going to add that to presentation that you're going to get in PDF. Sorry for that. Uh, and then moving to most important stuff, maybe not most, most important, but most interesting is JavaScript and SEO. I know you guys hear all this hype about JavaScript and SEO, and let me explain you why people are so excited about that. So JavaScript, Node.js, AngularJS, ReactJS, all those things are more and more popular last few months or years. Uh, and there is a lot of drama, like JavaScript versus SEO is so bad. Uh, but you need to understand why this drama appears. Like, it's very, very simple to solve. So, to do that, you need to understand what's rendering. It's very simple. I promise. I will make it simple for you guys. So that's a website. That's, that's a code in JavaScript. So as you can see, it's movie info and just line of JavaScript code. This is how it looks like after rendering. So if Googlebot is going to see just this one, they claim they, they render pages very well. They, they don't. They're, they're getting better at that, but far from uh, perfect. So that's how it looks like. It's because of one, uh, and just to give you an example, if you go to uh, hulu.com slash casual, that's a very popular website in the States, probably you heard about it, and look at any element using inspect element in Chrome. This is the code you're going to see. So you see H1 and perfectly laid out content. At the same time, if you're going to use view source, H1 is gone, and there is a lot of gibberish within the code. So that's how Googlebot will see the content, which is not rendered. And to render the code, Googlebot needs to process DOM, so the document object model. And it gets really, really complicated then. So that's all you need to understand right now. To check if it's crawled and indexed properly, use very simple command site colon colon slash, uh, dot com slash casual and see how this page is cached. Boom. It's gibberish again. This is actually a more complex problem because they're searching. Like, this is such a big development fail as, as it gets. So let's check it from the other side. Let's copy this content, like my daughter can do that, and search for that in Google. Again, you won't find this page because it's not indexable and not crawlable for Google. And this is all the data that you need to send to developers with a nice mem or giphy uh, image at the end to tell them, OK, it doesn't really uh, work well. It's not even mentioning what kind of URL is this one. I <laughs> didn't even open it. But uh, if you Google holo.com JavaScript case study, I, just, I wrote an article about that. They don't seem to care for like a year now. Uh, so there are three solutions to that. There is full pre-rendering, which everyone is so excited about. So you go to the service called pre-render.io, and it changes your JavaScript. Uh, spaghetti code into HTML. And there is, we're good with time. And there is partial pre rendering. So part of the code is pre rendered on server and it somehow is pre rendered on the client as well. And there is one thing that I'm really excited about called isomorphic JavaScript. If you want to read about that, if you Google isomorphic JavaScript search engine journal, 
you, you can see, again, article I wrote about merging those two technologies. Uh, but let me explain why, why, why I'm so uh, excited about that. Uh, JavaScript, in this case, runs on both server and client. So what you're going to get uh, is browser and Googlebot is going to get rendered code and all the fancy stuff that JavaScript does, all the interactions and navigation are left for the browser or Googlebot to render. So even if it fails, that's fine. And perceived load is 40% faster, fully crawlable by Google, for Googlebots, but there is one, one <laughs> trick, <laughs> which is this one. If you ever try to hire, hire a JavaScript developer, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's very difficult to develop for medium quality JavaScript developers. <laughs> I, I know a few good ones, like if you Google that article in Search Engine Journal, there is a name of guy I was consulting, very smart guy. Uh, but yeah, again, that's, that solves the JavaScript problem once and for all. So now moving to something uh, a little bit lighter, so content. And I know that uh, you heard some of this stuff already today. So basically, after we have all the performance stuff done, we need to... Oh, I didn't see that. So, yeah, we need to cut all the excess fat from our website. Uh, most, like most usual suspects, so indexable search, user profiles, you probably know, all those e-commerce filters, like sort by, big, for, sort by price, sort, sort, sort by the name, and stuff like that, and parameters that you need to set up in your Google Search Console. Don't forget about it. In, if, you get to, if you go to Google Search Console, parameters, you can set them to being crawled or not crawled and stuff like that. Also very cool. And there are also technical problem, problems that cause index bloat, and it's all very often forgotten. So I've got a challenge for you guys. Go to your client's website and enter a tr double trading slash anywhere within the URL. So go to a deeper page, enter the double trading slash. Six cases out of, out of 10, canonicals are going to be edited to index that. Page is going to be, so those URL will be fully indexable. There is much, many more like of those small bugs, but we had clients with really epic fails. Uh, some of them I mentioned at the very beginning, with really epic fails to, due to developers like forgetting to do that. One more thing, you, you should have trailing slash at the end of every single URL, and non-trailing slash version has to redirect. Again, I would say even more than six out of 10 of your clients, of actually clients coming to us, have this uh, very problem. Staging sites, that's a topic for a separate uh, presentation. You, developers are very creative in duplicating our clients' websites like a few times, and um, works like a charm as negative SEO uh, for, uh, for our clients. Uh, and after we do that, there is one thing that people of, often uh, forget. We need to focus on near duplicates. And there is that also called as 10, uh, 10 content. And if you go to tool like onpage.org, deep crawl, I'm not sure if search metrics has it, it's going to show you, as you can see, this is like 600,000 URLs crawled, and look how many similar pages there is. Like, there is like 16K pages with 10 or more similar URLs, also something that you need to uh, remove. Now going back, to going to a uh, very basic concept like subfolder versus subdomain, I know it can start a nice discussion here in the room. Uh, so subfolder, blog, informational content, store, basically everything that users are searching for. So if you have content that someone is searching for, include that in your subfolder. Subdomain, all the like, technical URLs that are not really indexable, support high-risk content, and that's mm, where interesting solutions come in. Like, we had a lot of clients, you know, forums are dying, so we had a lot of clients who were like, okay, we have a forum which is like 20 years old, uh, maybe 10, and we don't really want to invest in that anymore, and it's a shitload of bugs and index bloat and stuff like that. This is where we move uh, such stuff to subdomain, and it's very, very safe. It won't really affect our client's website if they don't want to invest in that, of course. Uh, moving forward, I have something in, f for you, like mortal SEO combat. You, you've been through a lot of data, so I want to give you, even though you're Germans, I want to give you a little bit of entertainment. <laughs> so, 
So there is a huge difference that uh, I think is crucial. And for us, when a new client comes along, we really look into that uh, closely. Difference between static website and database-driven database website. So that would be like Zalando or Doctor Database or whatnot. And this would be a content platform like, I don't know, Search Engine Journal. And there are a few key differences. So static website versus database-driven website. Number of pages. Uh, database-driven website has endless number of pages because you can index parameters, user profiles. There are endless options. So that's a huge risk, and that makes, that makes it much, much more difficult to, to work with them. Uh, quality of content. Usually, static websites, again, like content platforms and stuff like that, have uh, very high quality content, where database driven, like e commerce and stuff like that, usually have low or medium quality uh, content. But one more and the biggest problem that you, we all are facing, like the risk of index bloat, again, database driven website, static website, low and high. But there is one thing that actually uh, that, that wins it all. Uh, growth potential for database-driven websites is really endless, where for static websites, it's basically based on what you produce. So we tend to like look at our clients based on this metric the most. For us, database-driven large, large platforms are the best way to go because we can deliver really cool results. So again, for going back to our doctor mm, case study, uh, how we did that? Like, the simplest possible solutions, we implemented Q question and answers, so Q&A, and every single user can ask a doctor, like, I have a hemorrhoids, like, what do I do with that? All the questions that you wouldn't go and ask, like, your friend. Uh, of course, there was other questions as well. Uh, I didn't include them here, like, there are some hardcore questions people are asking, so, uh, sorry? No, 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 that's, that's, that's high quality, like people are searching for that as well. <laughs> but there is a moderation and that job is moderator of those questions. I wouldn't trade jobs for anything. Anyways, um, that's something that got, got us to a really nice start with basically we were generating thousands of questions every single month, uh, valuable questions replied from, for, by doctors. You can book a doctor appointment from the same doctor at the same time if, you, if your hemorrhoid problem is growing. So um, that's really, really cool. At the same, so, so basically database-driven website, uh, continuous technical SEO work, high growth potential, very high difficulty for, from technical SEO point of view. Uh, but, and we mostly focus on indexation strategy, so two key factors. And we focus on content automation and scalability, like in this case with Dr. Questions. Um, and there is one trick I wanted to give you uh, at the very end. Uh, it's international SEO trick that we implemented mm, recently. We do that more and more often. You can translate any website from English to English. It doesn't require any translation, as you probably figured by now. So if you have a domain and you implement proper href length, and you can target with this domain Canada, Australia, UK, New Zealand, Ireland, South Africa, and all the English-speaking countries, of course, if that content is valuable for those people as well. But if you like, mm, let me give you an example. That's our internal casino project. <laughs> it was growing very well. It's one of the few white hat casino websites. But yeah, still, going back to the topic. Uh, and we figured, okay, we don't really, it was US, so it didn't really monetize because after two years into the project, we figured, okay, uh, casinos are illegal in states. Uh, it's very smart of us. So we figured, okay, we need to do something. So if we've implemented slash UK URLs, again, just implementing hreflang, translating English to English. Uh, the same for, if that's, I think, Australia. Not very good in, in flags. Uh, so as you can see, just implementing this very simple trick for all you English-speaking uh, clients. I think it could work in Germany for like Austria, Switzerland, places like that. Never tried that. Uh, but what I actually mean with this presentation, we all need to leverage uh, the new technologies for SEO. And that's for example, for us, the key focus right now. So how to do that, how to use that for, um, for our clients. 
But to give you the final thought, technical SEO is very powerful for organic growth. It's better than content marketing. It's better than social media and all the other stuff because you get faster results. Even within one month, it's possible. Uh, it's easy to predict and scale. So if you work with international domains, presently like 105 countries or so, we know how to enter any new market fairly quickly. And you can see long-term results. So once you do that, for dynamic websites, it's more complicated. But once you do that, you can be sure that it's done uh, well. Uh, and that's one thing that I added recently. So one team, in this case, our SEO team with the development team, works on all the markets. It makes it so much easier compared to content marketing. Like we do content marketing in the agency. Like moving to 20 markets with content marketing, good luck. <laughs> like you need native speakers, complicated. So in this case, you don't need that. One tip, all the markets. Holistic approach because technical SEO affects performance, development, UX, speed, mm, and all these other factors basically uh, in mind. Creates awesome websites and technical SEO uh, kicks, uh, kicks us. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, feel free to ask questions. Have an open discussion. There's a lot of time left for us. So Seriously? You're, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, we can have a good discussion right now. Questions? Um, hi. Uh, my name is Lars. Uh, I was wondering, um, actually you, are, you just said that uh, you duplicated the uh, English version for multiple countries? Not to translate it. <laughs> <laughs> This is what you call it, okay. But um, have you looked into the possibility because Google uh, actually recommends to implement multiple alt lang tags? Sorry, if, can if you the English content is valu valuable for multiple English countries, you could actually also duplicate the alt lang tag for the same content page. Which what? Sorry, I didn't understand. The, the tag. alternate language. Alternate, tag. yeah. So we of course. You have not tried that, or uh, did it work? We implement hreflangs with basically. English version, and this one English version, so domain.com, has rel alternates in, in the code to all the different markets. So, so probably what you, what you asked about, if I understand properly. So yeah, basically rel alternate, alternate in code, and uh, .co goes to Australia and stuff like that. Translated. 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 <laughs> <laughs> If you go to like bookie.com, brusclay.com, which is interesting, go to brusclay.com. He did it like five years ago. Uh, is it recorded? <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah? Hi. Um, did you compare, compare this uh, as you did it uh, in a subfolder for the different. Um, English-speaking countries. So, did you ca or do you have data where you compared it when you change it on the top-level domain? Because I have experience with this, and if it's if you if you I mentioned that Pico DK study, we had 24 different TLDs, and we merged them into one. Oh, okay. So that gave us 800% uh, average growth. If you Google Pico DK study, uh, it's on on page. So I'm a huge fan of merging everything into one domain, especially that we had a lot of clients with 100 domains and 100 markets, separate domains and 100 manual penalties. So Google is fairly smart in figuring that's the same domain anyway. So because before it was less risky to have more domains, if you had like Panda problem in UK, you didn't have that in States. Right now it's a little more complicated and we're like huge fans of merging that into one. Okay, yeah, I just missed the information that you had it before as a top level domain. Thanks, hi, my name is Tom. Um, hey, Tom. Probably I missed the point, I have a short question about um, if it makes sense and if it's possible to do a above the fold cache optimization or um, in terms of um, uh, in relation to the Google bot. So, uh, so we are thinking about doing that for the users so that you can that if you, you can want to do but, but just above the fold 
um, because uh, we have a shorter delivery time to the user and the user says, oh, the page is already there, but we do not have the problem uh, to cope with the tons of caching problems we already have on the landing pages um, below the fold. And, and, and probably... So you just want to focus on above fold? Uh, yeah. So, so could I you state on that if it makes I sense? I would try to, fo to find all the elements that are above fold. Usually they are not so heavy because mostly images are a little bit lower and try to put them into server RAM, which is much faster than SSD drive. So uh, as I mentioned with the navigation example, so if you have a lot of um, like logos and stuff like that, whatever is above the fold, uh, maybe some static elements for menus and stuff like that, put that, that's usually around one megabyte. That's not for a for few thousand pages. So that's usually not that heavy. The best for us, the best would, was solution was to put that into memcache, so server's RAM, and use the regular cache for like heavy images and stuff like that. Yeah, so sorry, my question was, uh, what, what, what about the Googlebot? What does it say to that? Mm. Is it, is it, has it any relation to the Googlebot? Googlebot gets that quicker. So Googlebot gets the same content that user does. Hopefully. Uh, and <laughs> if Googlebot comes to the server and server doesn't have to look for those URLs, for those images, but has them in memcache, they don't go, like imagine now I'm, I'm the server, Googlebot came to me, and I have to go to the, my Google, my hard drive uh, to get those files. If they're in memcache, like I have them basically in my hands, so time, your time to first byte goes down very, very, uh, goes down a lot due to just that. So memcache basically makes it like you hold that in your, in your hands instead of grabbing that from your hard drive. Thanks. Um, like with the medicine website? Sorry? When the medicine website where you can ask questions to the yeah. doctor? Uh, doctor website, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, if there are 20 questions about the same topic, we How? manually moderate them. I told you the worst job ever, but we... <laughs> Not uh, automatic, but really... We have to have, we, well, like, first of all, when we first implemented that, we were so happy, we were celebrating. People entered the problems. I have a problem. My heard, head hurts. So most of the questions were very, uh, like, short. <laughs> You couldn't really sell it. I have a problem that was very popular, actually, in Italy, in Italian. So we uh, forced, like Quora does, we forced them to create longer titles. So that went very badly as well. Uh, and we had to hire a person who basically goes through the questions live. So there is like a few hundred questions a day, let's say. I don't know exactly. And they just added that to sound properly. And the content below, we also like had to mm, force them to create longer explanations, because like if you go to Quora, they do it really well with auto suggestions. We kind of copied some of the solutions. Yeah, but I get your question. If you just enable them to to ask whatever it is, uh, it's, it's gonna go go badly. We have few 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 websites which are uh, Q and A driven, and that's always one of the trickiest topic. <laughs> Hi, Sebastian is my name. Um, you, you mentioned um, search engine, um, search result pages, um, dealing with them. Sorry, um, can, you, can you say it again, sorry? Um, talking about um, search um, result pages on -site yeah. for on-site search. Um, usually uh, or often they're set to no index, um, which is okay. What would you think um, using post requests for on-site searches? We try to block them in robots, not to set them to no index, because that prevents Google from crawling them, wasting the crawler budget and stuff like that. Um, in general, which we are not huge fans of search results. We have few clients who like, he still does that for popular phrases. Uh, Robots takes that would be for me would be the best to basically cut that completely. Google can't crawl it and index it. Um, what's the benefit um, compared to post requests? Mm, what do you mean by post requests? Um, well, Google doesn't crawl post formula uh, requests, so. But you're gonna be left with the URL. 
Um, well, no, it all goes to the same URL, basically. So, like Ajax going back and forward to the database and not changing the URL? Yeah, right. That's totally fine, as long as people can't, like, post this, the, the URL on forum and do the post request, yeah. With, mm -hmm. So, basically, if that's dynamically, so like Ajax going back to the database, totally fine, as long as you can't somehow index that. Yeah. yeah. We, okay. we have a few clients doing that. The thing is, you can't track these uh, searches in, in that case. Or that's a little bit tricky because some people like would search on Zalando for awesome red shoes, and I want to share that with my friend because she's awesome and she's looking yeah, exactly. for those as well. Yeah. So we try to go with static URLs, but yeah, both solutions are okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>